Huda Beauty saw a massive global rise in popularity following the company's extremely well-structured and planned expansion. It was a groundbreaker in the industry for using social media and having that success transferred into brick and mortar stores. But during their journey, questions arose about whether their product versus their packaging is appropriate for their consumer, and thus Lee seems to foretell some very interesting developments in beauty retailing. Huda Beauty began as the Beauty 411 in 2010 as a blog, though it quickly changed names to Huda Beauty after people didn't really get the name. However, given how quickly the company was able to scale, I find it hard to believe that the blog began without considering its potential. You see, Huda Katan had gone to school to study makeup and finance, as had her sister Mona, who was working in PR, and immediately after moving to Dubai in 2010, Huda had already started creating products of her own for fun, including false eyelashes. But based on the fact that Huda herself regularly mentions in interviews that she's long-term oriented and that her YouTube channel was begun in 2007, I believe they started planning the business at this point. Unfortunately, it is impossible to truly confirm. But if I am correct, they would likely also have known that this was an enormous point of difference back in 2010 as it was not common for brands to be online at this point. Clearly, she had a big idea and was correct in her assumption that online beauty would be equally as big. But this was very much before beauty YouTube took off and instead this was still the days of Facebook. And so they began a Facebook page to promote the blog, even going as far as to pay for several $10 ads on Facebook to help promote further. However, she was smart in having already understood who her target market was. The blog, as with the Facebook, as with the Facebook ads, were very specifically geo-targeted towards Arab women across the world who may be in areas where they are underrepresented by the makeup brands in their local stores. This is how they initially grew their audience, by studying who their customer was in detail, by learning genuinely who their customer was and treating them as people, all of which caused an upward slope in popularity for Huda, who would soon see explosive growth in her socials in 2012-ish, when she claims in interviews that she started posting videos. So, she now has a successful YouTube, blog, Facebook and Instagram, so her online reach is sizable, and they know that they have a captive audience of primarily Middle Eastern women. By this point, both of her sisters, Mona and Alia, as well as her assistant, were already helping her with social media, and so they had a decent team and platform which they knew they could monetize. Especially considering their combined backgrounds, with at least two of the sisters studying finance, Huda studied makeup, Mona worked in PR and in banking, both Mona and Huda had years of experience in social media, and yes, admittedly we know less about Alia, but if she rivaled her sisters, they were extremely well qualified to begin this venture. And begin they did, with a loan of either 5,000 or 6,000 US dollars, the sources are unclear, from Alia, they began with just the one product, false eyelashes. False eyelashes were already a trend in 2013. They'd never really died as a trend, but the early 2010s is when we saw a resurgence of them, and the Huda team was right on the cusp of that. There are one size fits all, one product suits all, and a non-perishable product that is also extremely cheap to produce, has a high margin, and is very easy to be made by a third party, like a private label product, if needed, and works for the Middle Eastern makeup styles that do tend to focus more on the eyes. So the likelihood that this product would fail is slim, and if it didn't go well, could literally just be sold off slowly or at a discount if they weren't an immediate sellout. It's clearly a very smart product to begin with, however they needed sales channels. This was back in the day when online hadn't really started, so going direct to consumer was still seen as a real risk at the time, and probably not the best way to legitimize her business, so the reputation of the store was paramount to the product positioning and how it would be perceived by customers. All of which to say, considering they were coming from social media, they needed a store to legitimize the business. Huda says in this interview that she had a chance meeting with the general manager of Sephora in the Dubai Mall, who then agreed to become her first stockist and perhaps helped her get meetings with the Sephora US and Sephora EU, but they either rejected or ignored her. Regardless, Huda Beauty went into deal with the Dubai Mall branch of Sephora. They purchased 7,000 units of eyelashes, anticipating that they would sell out within a year. But to their surprise, 
They sold 2,000 in the first day alone, and the rest within a week. In context, there were actually seven styles of lashes, so it seems reasonable to assume that they had only 1,000 of each style, which obviously is an incredibly small order, but clearly was worth it for legitimizing her business and setting it up as a higher positioned item, which also makes sense with differentiating her lashes with the others that are on the market. This kind of beauty launch, at the time, would have been unfathomable. They didn't have a precedent to understand the impact of social media and how that sense of community and parasocial relationships could help drive a company's success offline just yet. So Huda Beauty blew all of the expectations out of the water. However, behind the scenes, things weren't going quite as swimmingly. Their distributor was overcharging, taking advantage of them because they were a small woman-led company. They also had issues being paid correctly and having companies not ordering the right quantities. It wasn't easy, they didn't really make any money, but the product was selling, so they were successful on paper at least. Within two years, they were still having these issues despite having grown exponentially, so it was clear that there was growth to be had, but for that, their logistics had to change. Huda's husband, Christopher Goncalo, joined the company as COO, Chief Operating Officer, to fix these exact issues and to secure a proper distribution channel for the company that would benefit their long-term scaling strategy. This also marked the first time that the sisters could actually pay themselves a salary, as much like many business owners, for the first few years they simply couldn't afford to. Within the same year, 2015, they became stocked by Sephora US after they saw people from all over the world travel to Dubai to pick up a now Kim Kardashian endorsed pair and once again saw a huge surge in popularity as they responded to consumer demand. This ultimately seemed like a test to see if her Middle Eastern focused brand could find a footing in the predominantly white Western countries who simply she had never targeted but had grown a following with nonetheless. They obviously did find a footing and it became a real turning point for the brand as they had found a secondary market that boosted sales quite significantly. It wasn't easy, but because of this, they managed to scale very quickly. In 2016, they launched lip contour pencils, liquid matte lipsticks and their eyeshadow palette all within months of each other. Each of these was an enormous success in its own right, had a lot of positive reviews on YouTube now that the rise of beauty YouTube was in full swing, and really changed the game for the company. They went from a lash specialist to a company with four hit products all within the space of a year. But make no mistake, these products were still made for the Middle Eastern woman, and their fame amongst the predominantly Western YouTube space was not their true market. In fact, even their expansions into Western spaces seemed to continue to target Middle Eastern people that lived there, evidenced by their August 2016 London launch in Harrods, which is owned by an Arab man, Mohammed Al Fayed, positioning them as a luxurious and exclusive brand in an opulent environment that Middle Eastern consumers are known to gravitate towards, proved by the fact that they quickly became one of the top selling brands in the Harrods Beauty Hall. At this time, the Middle East accounted for the fourth biggest beauty market in the world, with a $25 billion spend in the previous year alone, and Huda was one of the biggest indie brands with, by the end of 2016, 44 full-time staff, making her just shy of the 50 employees needed to be considered a medium enterprise, but much larger than her most direct competition, Shifa Dubai Skincare, the only other indie brand stocked by Sephora UAE at the time, who I believe had around 20 to 25 full-time employees in 2016, though I couldn't find that totally confirmed. Because of this, the women were ready to scale once more. On the 2nd of February 2017, they officially announced the launch of Huda Beauty Foundation that would be released on October 1st, 2017. The product would feature 30 shades of foundation, from a yellowy light tone to a dark brown with either red or green undertones. However, something you may remember is that Fenty also launched in 2017 and obviously blew Huda Beauty out of the water in terms of sales. Of course, Rihanna's fame is bigger and a 40-tone foundation range is bigger and therefore better than Huda's 
30, so the differentiator that Huda was going for just didn't exist anymore. Plus, unfortunately for Huda, this also meant that there were a lot of comparisons drawn between the two for having similar ideas, and often meant that Huda got called a copycat just because hers was less famous, less celebrity-endorsed. Yet, Fenty Foundation was actually only announced in August 2017, eight months after Huda teased hers in December 2016 on Instagram Live, with Fenty releasing on the 8th of September 2017, one month before Huda's on October 13th. I know people in the makeup world would be privy to launches going on in the year, but obviously it would take time to formulate and test all of these shades, so genuinely it just seems like these women both had similar ideas, and simply Fenty sniped Huda to the punch. However, something that is clear when comparing the two brands is that they are seemingly for different markets. You'll notice how Fenty's light tones are often more pink and that fades into an orange and green undertones in the darker foundation, while Huda's are nearly all yellow and green undertones, especially yellow towards the lighter foundations. This, in my opinion, indicated that they really are made for the Middle Eastern audience, the same target market that the company had been focused on all this time. It makes sense, therefore, why Fenty's foundation worked better on a Western audience, because Huda's just simply is not made for them as explicitly as Fenty's is. Instead, Huda's is made for the Middle Eastern or even Middle Eastern descended people around the world, which is really quite obvious when you look at the demographics of people used to model the foundations. Unfortunately though, that doesn't mean they weren't impacted by these comparisons. Of course the brand was. The US and the EU was a big market for them, so how could they not be, despite how overwhelmingly positive the reviews actually were? But in comparison to other companies who really rely on these markets, Huda was much less negatively impacted in terms of sales because the people complaining were not their target audience, they were their secondary audience. And yet, despite being their second audience, it doesn't seem as if her Western fans were really aware of this when it came to complaints. Because though their complaints were valid in their own Western market, they didn't have much of an effect on the business as a whole, with the effect being limited to just slowing the expansion of the company into that Western market. That being said, there were two main complaints in this audience, and pretty major ones at that. The first came as accusations of homophobia, and the second of pandering to a black audience. This second one, Jackie Ina can be tracked to the catalyst of, specifically noting on her box of foundation, there were a wide range of women smiling and laughing to indicate the 30 shades, which makes sense, the product differentiator would have been about range if Fenty didn't be her to the punch. But in comparison to that, the Huda Beauty Instagram page features extremely few people with darker skin, or as Ina says, anyone darker than Tan, anyone darker than Beyonce, with this blog calculating that only between 2 and 1% of posts have someone in that tonal range. I obviously went to their Instagram to confirm, and yes, it is low, slightly improved today, but still definitely low. However, to bring that into context for her actual target market, it's known that there is a lot of colorism in the Middle East, which is something Jackie Ina actually brings up herself in her original video, and something that Huda herself talks about hating her skin tone as a child, thinking she was dark and wanting to be like her sister who was lighter. I personally asked my partner who is from Turkey and his girlfriends back in the Middle East their opinion on this as people who are truly not westernized, and they did confirm it is like this. There are lightning and whitening products still, and colorism does affect some people, less so young women, but still definitely affects some people on how they perceive beauty. This comes through on how people feel when seeing models on social media. They simply would rather see people that look like themselves or their Middle Eastern idealized version of beauty than anyone else, which they did say was colorism, they didn't want to excuse that, but said it may explain who the brand shares if that's what her audience is responding to. This can be seen in other top brands in the Middle East as well, like Basanfa 2 Cosmetics. However, 
When we discuss the packaging specifically and their use of black people, South Asian people, darker Middle Eastern people as well, they did not inherently see it as progressive so much as took it as the brand almost imposing their Western ideals onto them in a way like saviorism. They said it's simply not Huda's job to change the ideals of the Middle East through her Americanized ideals. So while a Western audience may see this packaging as progressive, it does not have the same connotation for her main audience. Therefore, Jackie Aina was very correct when she said it was pandering, but instead of just pandering to black people, it is instead pandering to the entire Western market. This links into the question raised by James Welsh a little later in 2020, but I think is relevant now, that their packaging versus their product and promotion of the product doesn't produce a cohesive vision for the brand. Why have the Western idea of an idealized beauty on the box if the product inside is not meant for a Western market? But that is not to say, of course, that this critique of colorism is not unfounded and obviously affected her perception in this, her secondary market, and still does today, as unfortunately it still seems that they haven't fully committed in either direction, which in my opinion is the biggest flaw with the company at the moment. This inconsistency born of walking a line between two markets that simply want opposite things. This then brings us to the second major complaint of homophobia. I couldn't find the exact source of the original complaint, but it stems also from her social media, where you'll find there's also very few men. This was a critique that many people were quick to liken to homophobia, but obviously wearing makeup does not make you gay, and considering if you look back at the PR, Huda had used men in the initial swatch imagery, and with their repeated outspokenness for the queer community, especially during Pride Month, despite a fair amount of backlash within her main audience, including a hashtag about cancelling Huda Beauty going viral in the UAE, this is actually incredibly progressive for her main audience, though again that does also pull into question whether this is pushing Western ideals onto a Middle Eastern audience. So, with those two main complaints explored, it is obvious that it's undeniable that in their promotion, they simply are not as broad in representation as one would expect from a Western brand. I'm sure this comes from the two markets wanting literally opposite things in terms of representation, both for gender and for skin tone, and clearly it has been a difficult line to walk on. However, because of their lack of conviction with which audience to target, something we're still seeing to this day, unless this is addressed more clearly, it will continue to affect the brand's authenticity in both markets. But yet, despite all of this controversy, the launch, which came along at the same time as a primer, a highlighter set that launched a short while before, and a buff blend brush, it was a real success on the global stage, not just in their main target of the Middle East. So, having proved the company viable on the world stage, despite having a few scandals, they needed capital to really expand the business. All of which led to 2017, when they sold a minority stake in the business to TSG Consumer Partners for an undisclosed amount meant to finance their growth. On this topic, considering TSG Consumer Partners is a San Francisco-based brand, this can be read as an indicator that the brand has begun to take the Western market more seriously as they could learn from TSG's experience within the American market. However, contrary to adapting Huda Beauty to fit in with the American market more, they instead launched several other companies for that market, including their first perfume launched as a sub-brand, their Facebook show, and their new investment company, HB Investments, all of which led them to receiving a billion dollar valuation after the company stabilized through these multiple revenue streams. However, while the sisters had secured themselves as a parent with the multiple revenue streams, over at the brand Huda Beauty, their biggest scandal to date was around the corner, after she was accused of copying a smaller brand's idea for a campaign shoot. The campaign in question was for her new setting powder that played on the term baking, which is a term to indicate leaving powder on the face to let it sink in before brushing off the excess. However, because another brand named Beauty Bakery had a whole 1950s cooking in pastel thing as their whole branding, not just in the one shoot, 
the public seemed to think that they were too similar and ultimately that Huda's campaign could easily be confused with the beauty bakery brand as a whole. But, unlike her previous controversy, this affected both the Western and the Middle Eastern audience. As a result, the scandal had real legs to it. The beauty community really jumped on this. There was certainly more concern over this than the racism and homophobia rumblings before. It really did get a lot of people riled up, and it certainly didn't help that Kashmir Nicole, owner of Beauty Bakery, is a black woman, so people saw Huda now as stealing black ideas after the whole pandering thing. Which, after Jeffree Star jumped on this, just expanded the awareness of the situation, making it a huge talking point in the community, where everyone seemingly had an opinion. There of course were counter-arguments that frankly neither campaign was original, with some saying that baking, sounding like baking, isn't exactly rocket science, and the idea of 50s aesthetics is really big in beauty. Think Too Faced, Benefit Cosmetics, or even in social media with Erin Parsons having a real blow-up for her vintage makeup archive. So some people saw this as Huda being unfairly targeted with this controversy, and also some people linked that to her race as well. But it certainly wasn't helped that another two years later, she had a very similar scandal with her Pastel Obsessions palette looking rather reminiscent of the Colourpop Pastel palettes. Though of course it is definitely possible that both of the brands may simply have organically had similar ideas at a similar time, which is something brought up by Phenomenon by this book, so it is a studied thing. Yet, though it may have slowed the buzz around the brand, they just continued to grow. Expanding in the UK with a contract with Boots being signed in 2020, where it's worth noting that there still is a large and underserved Middle Eastern community, which we know as her primary audience. Huda may be a large company, but often you'll find these kinds of brands hyper-target on communities in order to get a good foundation on which to expand in the future. So because of these scandals, it really looks like that is their game plan at the moment, and it reminds me somewhat of this book by Seth Godin for their ability to make such a dedicated community, or tribe as Godin puts it, which may come to explain why their social media, which we discussed before, hasn't changed. Perhaps it is that the product and the place are being used to hyper-target, while the promotion is being used more like a defense. They simply cannot escape that they have a Western audience, even if it's not explicitly planned. So, their social media as promotion may be merely to appease this outspoken crowd in order to allow them peace, under which they can grow and serve their tribe more directly. The sisters say repeatedly that they're planning on the long term, planning for after they die, they want to be the new Estee Lauder. And if that means completely dominating the makeup for the Middle Eastern woman across the world for a few years to wait for another gap in the market to expand through, seemingly that is what they're doing. Effectively, this target market allows them a small hub of customers in most of the major cities in the world, if not all. So it's an incredibly well-planned strategy if this is what they're going for, though of course none of that can be confirmed because they don't release any of their public information. But, saying that, even Huda herself, the founder, stepped down from the role of CEO in 2020 to a more creative role in the business, firstly so she was able to use her strength in other creative areas, but mostly in order to put someone better in that position to make the company go further, evidencing the fact that they are very dedicated on preparing this company for large expansion. However, it seems that as a result of this, their US and EU customers have become less considered in their formulation production. As just recently in 2022, Huda Beauty was sued for using four ingredients that were illegal to use in eye products in the US as they may have irritation or staining problems, and then purposely tried to conceal this by hiding warning labels. The product has already been pulled from EU distribution, US buyers can get a refund, and she's paid 3.1 million in total for the fines and legal charges in the US. However, I actually looked these up, and they are legal in the UAE as long as Red 22 isn't used in hair products, and therefore they're still for sale there. But because of everything we've discussed, it seems that this is likely born of neglect for their secondary market, 
than anything else. And obviously their reputation in the UK and the US has severely suffered as a result, which you probably know if you're watching this video. But because the Western audience is simply not who this brand is for, it ultimately will not kill the business. In fact, it seems to have had little to no impact on the business in her main market if any of the blogs I Google translated are to be believed. Actually, what seems to have had a bigger impact on the brand's public perception was the scandal back in April where she mocked a member of the public using colour corrector on her face, saying that she was using too much. Mina, the creator, obviously talked about the situation in a response where she actually mentioned how disappointed she was that she was treated this way by somebody she thought represented her, which obviously from a marketing perspective is far worse than just the roasting aspect of it. By having a controversy that directly affected her target market, this will do more damage in the long term and evidences how today the issue of colorism that was brought up before by Jackie Aina could affect the business if they are to continue to target the Middle Eastern person that lives across the world. Ultimately, this is a well-structured and well-funded company, but it is built on the back of an underrepresented niche. So keeping that niche happy across the world is a huge part of the longevity in this company. They are still doing well though despite this, hence the name of the video, and the company has now boomed to two hundred million dollars in annual sales and become the number one beauty brand in the Middle East. Sure, the people within this niche, even in countries outside the UAE, have other options now in brands like Fenty, but even with the few scandals, why would these customers go to a brand that caters for everyone when they can go to a brand that is owned by, promoted by, and targeted towards people exactly like them? Especially in this period where sources like the New York Times are claiming that foundation is dead, we simply aren't wearing it in the same way as we did before, if at all, why not turn to a brand that is dedicated towards you as a consumer? This in turn makes me curious about the ever-changing landscape of beauty, as if we will see a future where brands do become hyper-niched in order to better encompass every consumer as a joint effort instead of one brand individually trying to cater to every single person at the same time. Effectively turning the aim of these companies to trying to gain a monopoly into trying to get an oligopoly. In which case, if beauty does go into this hyper-niche, market-driven oligopoly in the future, Huda will be really ripe to take advantage of that because they have been so niche focused for so long. Sometimes trying to cater to everyone means you cater to no one and it seems Huda Beauty is poised to capitalize off of this if and when it does happen. For now, the company is laying low, that's undeniable. But because of the diversification in revenue streams thanks to HB Investments and their many other brands, they can really afford to do this, especially considering how loyal the Huda Beauty customer actually is. The company is nowhere near fallen, despite what the Western public perception at the moment might make you believe. And if anything, it seems Huda seems to have quite a bright future in this hyper-targeted beauty if they can either get the balance between Middle Eastern and Western audiences right or just drop the unnecessary pandering to the Western audience altogether because it seems like even without that market, they will continue to dominate. Thank you so much for watching. Please subscribe and hit the notification bell for more videos like this one. Check out my fashion channel Understitch for videos like this but about fashion brands and my Patreon is linked below for early access.